Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become uh, one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, today's episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thanks so much for your support and uh uh, today's episode of A Life in Your Hands is Murder in the Eye Doctor's Office. Partially transcribed. The National Broadcasting Company presents Earl Stanley Gardner's A Life in Your Hands. What was she wearing? Was the door open? Where was the weapon? Listen while we place A Life in Your Hands. You never know when you step from the safety of your home when you may witness a violent death and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard. Murder is a dark enigma that strikes fear into the heart of man. Strange, baffling, mysterious. But the darkest crime one man can invent, another man can unravel. Such a man is Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, the world's most popular writer of mysteries, creator of Perry Mason, and many other outstanding characters. Here's your key, Mr. Kegg, room 102. Thanks, Jim. I can always count on you to remember my room number. I guess so. It isn't often we have famous people staying at this hotel. How come you stay in a little town like this when you could go to someplace important? Well, when I'm on a vacation, Jim, I like to take it easy. Lie in the sun, swim, eat good meals, and relax. Most of all, I like to avoid crowds. I bet you like to get away from crime, too, don't you? Yes, Jim, but I've found, much to my dismay, that no matter where you go, crime is not far away. You never know when or where violence will strike, or when you'll suddenly become a witness to a crime and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard. Even now, somewhere nearby, there may be a crime in the making. Dr. Matthews' office. No, the doctor is out. May I help you? Yes, we have office hours tonight. Oh, you'd like your eyes examined? Mm, yes, we can take you at seven. Your name, please. Mrs. Selinger? Thank you for calling, Mrs. Selinger. We'll see you tonight. Bye. What are you doing here? Dr. Matthews isn't in. I know. That's why I came. Why don't you leave me alone? How many times have I told you I don't want you around? My dear Miss O'Connor, being the owner of this building gives me every right to be here. Don't you dare come near me. I just want to talk to you. I wouldn't think of touching a hair of your innocent head. Don't forget, I know all about your pretty past. Take your hands off me. Uh, don't pull that toy act on me. You let me go. Bite me. I'll teach you. Liz! Crane, get away from her. Well, Sir Galahad the Deathus to the rescue. We're just having a little fun. This is the first time she's objected. You ought to be killed. Those are harsh words. Liz, are you all right? Yes, Paul. Please get him out of here. Crane, you get out temper, of here. Temper, temper. Your fair damsel isn't hurt. And she's not so fair. Get out! It's hardly the way to talk to a man you owe 15000 You get your money, I'm you... I'm sure I will. The next payment is due Tuesday. Either you pay or out goes your precious equipment. I don't know why Beggars I... can't be choosers. <laughs> I haven't had so much fun in years. Ah, oh, the illustrious Dr. Matthews. What do you want here, Crane? Maybe your rent. I paid it yesterday. David, he's been bothering Liz. I have to get back to my office. I left a patient in the chair. Are you out of your mind, Crane? I'm just a bit taken with your assistant. Get out of here. Look, I'm the one who does the evicting around here, and I don't take a lot of guff from tenants. 
What did you come here for? Just to bother Miss O'Connor? This is a professional call. I want my eyes examined. Why don't you go to someone else? Because you're the best. I'll be here at seven. We have an appointment for seven. You'll take me first. You'll always consider me first. All right. Come at seven. I'll put drops in your eyes. By the time they take effect, maybe the other examination will be finished. Count the minutes, Miss O'Connor, until you see me again. How long has he been bothering you? Months. I haven't said anything. He could ruin me. He knows all about Paul and me. If it got back to Paul's wife, he'd lose his practice. It's none of my business, but you're playing with fire. No, it's none of your business. I'm sorry, Dr. Matthews. On edge, I guess. Oh, one of your earrings is on the floor. Oh. Here. Thanks. Good heavens, Liz. Was he so rough that he knocked an earring off? No, I always take one off when I answer the phone. These dangle kind get in my way. What are we going to do, Doctor? I mean about Crane. I don't know. But something has to be done. I'm home, Helen. And only an hour late for dinner. Who's the girl this time? Does my being late always have to involve a woman? Being you, it always does. Your dinner's cold. And so are you, my dear. A walking refrigerator. If you divorced me, Henry, you wouldn't have to put up with it. For the hundredth time. Oh, you obviously detest me. My utter dislike for you is surpassed only by my utter delight in tormenting you. Once and for all, no. I can't take much more of you. I'm about at the end of my rope. I'll give you a little more. Maybe you'll hang yourself. <laughs> you're the most despicable man I've ever But you married me. For your money. Now you're paying for it. It all comes out, Helen. You always have to pay for what you get. Someday you're going to get something you haven't counted on. Look, I'm going over to Dr. Matthews at 7 o'clock to have my eyes examined. It shouldn't take longer than an hour. I'll expect you to pick me up. Why? Can't you drive? He's going to put drops in my eyes. I won't be able to see. In that case, no. You be there. As long as I have money, you'll do what I say. Good evening, Mrs. Salinger. Uh, good evening. The doctor will be right with you. Oh, isn't he here yet? Oh, he's in the treatment room. I've never had an examination before. He won't put anything in my eyes, will he? Yes. Will it hurt? Will I be able to see? Oh, there's nothing to become alarmed about. The drops are merely to dilate your pupils so the doctor can better test your eyes. Oh, your sight may be hazy for a while, but you don't have anything... Mrs. Salinger, will you come in, please? Oh, thank you, doctor. Now, if you'll sit in this chair... Yes. Now, lean back. Please look up at the ceiling, Mrs. Salinger. That's it. There. <laughs> Cold, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Now, look up. There. Uh, All uh, finished. Just close your eyes. Mm -hmm. It'll only be a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I'll be back. Thank you, Doctor. Paul, are you working tonight? I want to be right across the hall if you need me. No telling what that fool crane might try. He won't try anything tonight. I know. How can you be so sure? He wouldn't dare while I'm in the office. But you have another patient. That means you'll be in the other room most of the time. Don't worry. I'm putting drops in his eyes. He's so far-sighted, he'll be practically blind. He won't even be able to find Liz. Oh, as uh, long as I'm over here, could I borrow a hypo of sodium pentothal? I've got a wisdom extraction coming in tonight. Certainly. I'll get it for you. Thanks. Here you are, Paul. Thanks, David. Liz, as soon as I get the drops in Crane's eyes, you can go home. Yes, Dr. Matthews. Good evening. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. I'll be across the hall, Liz. Ah, oh, I see you're here to protect your, uh, uh, interests. You try one more trick like this afternoon and I'll beat you to a pulp. No, you won't. Because I dispossess you of your equipment and your office space so fast you'd be selling pencils in the street. I'm not afraid of you, Dr. Moore, because I have you right where I want you. Under my thumb. Uh, you go to blazes. <laughs> the age-old battle of love versus career. <laughs> Shall we proceed, Dr. Matthews? I'm ashamed to even treat you. Careful, your ethics are showing. 
Ethics should never show. Isn't that right, Miss O'Connor? I don't know what you're talking about. You've never let them color your life. I... Don't <sighs> protest, please. I've followed your career, or uh, rather your past, very revealing. I'm sure Mrs. Paul Moore would find it fascinating. Either you shut up and let me start the examination, or... Or what, Doctor? If someone doesn't kill you someday, it will be a miracle. Blow the other way, please. You must have had onions for dinner. Come on, Crane. Into the side room. Sit here. Now, look up. Oh. The other eye. Look up. Hey, that's cold. Sit here till I get back. Mr. Salinger, you may open your eyes. Just lean your head back on the headrest. There. Let me take a look. I want to be sure the drops have taken effect. Mm Mm-hmm. Just sit here a while longer and look into those lenses. It's a refractor. I want you to get used to it. Now, please excuse me. Oh, of course, Doctor. Liz, you can go home now. Where are you going? Down to buy some gum. I have enough change. I'm ready to leave. Uh, Don't forget to turn the sterilizer off. I won't. Good night. Good night. See you in the morning. Thanks for staying down. Matthews? Matthews, how long do I have to sit here with my eyes closed? Matthews, answer me. What's that bubbling noise? Matthews, where are you? I I know it's you. Answer me. everyone. Dr. Matthews? Henry? Oh, there you are. Henry, how soon will you be finished? I've got to go over to... Henry? Oh! Henry! Liz! What, what is it? What's Liz? Oh, Mrs. Crane. It's Henry. He's been stabbed! <laughs> my key, please, Jim. Oh, oh, Mr. Kegg. Sorry, I was reading about the murder. Yes, it was a terrible thing. Mr. Kegg, I know Dr. Matthews didn't do it. I know. What makes you so sure, Jim? I go to him for glasses. He's been swell to me. Never charged me the full price because he knows I can't afford it. Mr. Kegg, he couldn't have killed Henry Crane. It seems like an open and shut case. Dr. Matthews had the motive, the opportunity, the weapon, and the flimsy excuse. Practically everybody in town had a motive for killing Crane. Nobody liked him. Oh, Mr. Kegg, you're so good at being a lawyer. Well, I don't mean exactly a lawyer. Uh, amic- uh, amicus curiae? Yeah. Well, what does it mean? Well, amicus curiae, literally translated, means friend of the court. An amicus curiae works neither for the prosecution nor the defense, only in search of the truth. I cross-examine witnesses. Why aren't there more like you? (laughs) Well, you see, you don't get paid for it, Jim. I'm fortunate enough that I can do this kind of work gratis, for free. If you don't get paid for your work, then I can't very well ask you to... Jim, my work is done purely in the interest of justice. Tell you what, I'll review the facts of the case and see what can be done for your doctor friend. Please. Your Honor, there are certain weaknesses in the evidence against Dr. Matthews. In view of his fine reputation as a doctor, I should like to enter the case as amicus curiae. Your reputation as an expert in cross-examination is well known, Mr. Kegg. We are fortunate to have you with us. You may proceed. I should like to recall Mrs. Henry Crane to the stand. Mrs. Crane... Will you tell the court again precisely what occurred when you went to Dr. Matthews' office on the night of the murder? 
Well, I, I came in the front door of the office. Is there more than one entrance to Dr. Matthews' office? I don't know. Most doctor's offices have a rear entrance, don't they? It depends on the layout of the building. I went into the waiting room. There was no one at the reception desk where Mr. Connor usually sits, so I called to see if there was anyone in the office. No answer. I went through the little reception room and into the hallway that leads to, well, to the treatment room. There was Henry sitting in a chair with his eyes closed. Did you notice whether the door to the uh, other treatment room was closed? I didn't notice that. Oh, yes, yes, it was open. Yes, it was, but it, it was very dark inside. Well, uh, Henry had his eyes closed, as I was saying. I, I started to talk to him, and then I saw the blood on his shirt front. I screamed, he's been stabbed, and Dr. Matthews and Dr. Moore came running in. How did you know your husband had been stabbed? Why, because it was bleeding down the front of his shirt. Couldn't the blood have come from another type of wound? Anyone knows the difference between a knife wound and a wound which makes a large hole at the point of entrance. You're a registered nurse, aren't you, Mrs. Crane? Before I was married, I was a trained nurse. Then you know how to administer a hypodermic. Yes. Did you know that your husband had been given a hypodermic of sodium pentothal before he was stabbed with a scalpel? I heard the coroner's report. What do you know about sodium pentothal, Mrs. Crane? It's an anesthetic that acts very quickly. You and your husband weren't getting along, were you? I don't see how my personal life has any bearing on this case against Dr. Matthews. It may have a bearing, Mrs. Crane. Look at it this way. You entered the office and found no one there but your husband with drops in his eyes, practically blind. You're a trained nurse. So you go back to the treatment room, fill a hypo with sodium pentothal, take a scalpel, inject the anesthetic, stab your husband, wipe the scalpel and hypo syringe clean, put them in the sterilizer and scream that your husband has been killed. Ridiculous! I didn't kill Henry. I may have hated him, but I didn't kill him. I'm not saying you did, Mrs. Crane. I'm just saying you could have. And I'm showing you that your personal life could have quite a bearing in such a case. That will be all, thank you. Now, wait just a minute. I'm not going to sit here and... Is there me. something more you would like to tell us? I, I didn't have time to kill him. Did it enter your mind? I didn't say that. Henry was dead when I got there. Thank you. That will be all. Dr. Paul Moore, please. <laughs> Dr. Moore, you have testified that Henry Crane threatened to dispossess you of your expensive equipment in your office space. That's right. Everyone had some reason to dislike Crane. He made it his business. Do you keep office hours every night? Only when needed. Your office is right across the hall from Dr. Matthews? Yes. Did you hear anything unusual at the time of the murder? No. No, I can't say I did. I heard Dr. Matthews and Liz, uh, Miss O'Connor, leave. And then a little while later, I heard Mrs. Crane's screams. Did they leave together? Liz left by the elevator, and then right after, Dr. Matthews went down the stairs. How do you know? I was watching. Sort of peeking out your door? Well, I... When you knew the two had left... You knew Crane was alone. I knew Mrs. Selinger was in the treatment room. I'd been over earlier to b borrow something. Anyone who knew Mrs. Selinger was there and planned to kill Crane would have made sure it was a soundless murder. Probably. Do you have an assistant when you work at night? I work alone. That rather limits you to fillings and cleanings and such, doesn't it? Yes, I don't usually do it. Yet Miss O'Connor testified earlier that you had borrowed a hypodermic of sodium pentothal from Dr. Matthews for an extraction that night. I meant it for the morning. Couldn't you have borrowed it in the morning? I suppose so, but as long as I was there... You I... just stated that you went to Dr. Matthews' office to borrow something. Wasn't the something the anesthetic? I didn't mean that. What did you mean? I don't know. That'll be all for now, Dr. Moore. I would like to recall Miss O'Connor to the stand. In your earlier testimony, Miss O'Connor, you stated that Henry Crane had made advances. He was unbearable. He seemed to enjoy frightening me. I see. Where did you go when you left the office? Home. I was quite tired. I'd had a hectic day. Do you live alone? Yes, I live in an apartment. Did anyone see you come home? I doubt it. I went right up and went to bed. No one saw you? I'll think. Dr. Matthew saw me leave. And anyway, why should there have to be anyone's word besides mine? When I leave the office every day, I don't think of establishing an alibi for something Very that true. I... Mr. Connor, how long have you worked for Dr. Matthews? Four years. Do you get along as employer and employee? Dr. Matthews is one of the finest men I've ever known. He hated Crane. We all did. But I feel sure he didn't kill him. Miss O'Connor, do you realize that if Dr. Matthews didn't kill Crane, the murderer made every attempt to make it look like he did? That's true. But... But I... That'll be all, thank you. Will Dr. Matthews please take the stand? Dr. Matthews, you state that you left the office to buy chewing gum. Yes. I had onions for dinner and didn't want to offend my patients. <laughs> Is it customary to leave a patient in the treatment room? After administering drops, I had my patients sit with their eyes closed for a while. 
That night, neither of the patient's pupils had dilated enough, so I left them for a while longer in the dark room. I see. Where did you go for the chewing gum? There's a little old man who runs a candy stand on the floor below. Did the man recognize you? He wasn't there. I waited a few minutes. Then I heard Mrs. Crane scream and ran back upstairs. Did anyone see you? I'm afraid not. Dr. Matthews, why didn't you kill Crane? Well, I... I, I thought of it, but I... I knew I couldn't. I couldn't jeopardize my family, my profession. I... I never dreamed the insignificant act of buying chewing gum could be so important. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Your Honor, there are many obvious aspects to this case... But I have found in my experience that with every murder, there is a sound pattern. A sequence of sounds or absence of sounds that, when placed in proper order, must spell the truth. I ask the court to adjourn until tomorrow, at which time I shall recall a completely disinterested witness. Permission is granted. Court is adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Jonathan Kegg is about to call another witness. It could be you. If it were, could you remember what you have heard? It would be vital that you do, for you would hold a life in your hands. To build our strength against possible aggression, we must equip our armed forces with the weapons of war. And at the same time, in order to defeat inflation, we must produce adequate supplies of civilian goods. There's only one way to meet this double challenge, and that's by turning out more goods and services for every hour we work. Remember, the better we produce, the stronger we grow. Mrs. Salinger, who was in the other treatment room when Henry Crane was murdered, has been recalled. Court has convened. Jonathan Kegg commences his cross-examination. Mrs. Salinger, I understand from a review of the records that you have already been called in this case. Uh, yes, Mr. Kegg, but I couldn't be of any help. What makes you so sure? Well, as you know, the, the pupils of my eyes had been dilated, and I was in a dark room sitting behind a big machine. I couldn't possibly see anything. Well, frankly, Mr. Selinger, I'm not interested in anything you could or could not have seen. Now, will you please tell the court exactly what you heard when Henry Crane died? Well, uh, I heard talking out in the reception room. Whom did you hear? Oh, uh, Miss O'Connor and, and Dr. Matthews and Dr. Moore. Uh, they were talking about Crane. I, I couldn't hear much. And then Crane came in. Did you know Mr. Crane? By then, I'd heard about him. Uh, go on, please. I heard Dr. Moore threatened to beat up on Crane and... And Dr. Matthew said, real loud, if someone doesn't kill you, it'll be a miracle. Order! Order in the court! Then what happened? Then uh, Dr. Matthews took Crane back to the other treatment room and, and put drops in his eye. Yes, and then? Well, uh, then he, uh, the doctor, uh, came into the side room and, and put a big kind of machine up to my eyes. Your Honor, I have brought an actual refractor into court. With your permission, I would like to exhibit it. You may proceed. Will you roll it over here, please? Is this what you mean by a machine? Yes, that's it. Mrs. Selinger, what did you hear next? Well, the doctor excused himself, and, and I heard coins jingling in his hand. How did you know they were coins? What? Why, I heard them. But you couldn't see them. Well, no, I couldn't, but I know they were. I heard Dr. Matthews tell Miss O'Connor he was going to buy some chewing gum. And then? Well, Miss O'Connor said she was ready to leave. I heard her high heels clicking. It, it, it was real quiet. And then I heard a, a bubbling sound. A crane called out to ask what the noise was. I started to tell him that the doctor was out. But then I, I heard the jingling of coins. So I guess the doctor must have come back. Did you hear footsteps? N no, none. Had you heard Dr. Matthews' footsteps before? No, he, he was wearing rubber-soled shoes. What did you hear after that? Well, I heard this jingling some more and, and the bubbling and... And then a, a metal click. The jingle was real faint then. I see. Was this jingling sound constant? It was in, uh, oh, spurts, uh, uh, like the coins were in his pocket when he walked. Then the sound pattern went like this. A bubbling sound in the background, a sporadic jingle, loud, then faint, then loud, then faint, then a metallic click, and then the jingle became louder, then faded. There was silence except for bubbling. Yes. 
Yes, th- that's right. Your Honor, I would like to place the refractor up to Mrs. Selinger's eyes. I have asked each of the people involved to wear exactly what they wore on that night. With your permission, I would like each to walk by Mrs. Selinger. Also, I have brought a sterilizer, which is now boiling. Now, Mrs. Selinger, I'll bring the refractor up to your eyes. There. Now, first, I would like you to come forward. Would you please remove your shoes and walk past the witness? This is ridiculous. Thank you. You may sit down. And now, you please. Quiet, please. There must be absolute quiet. My Phi Beta Kappa key hitting my keychain. Is that the sound you heard, Mrs. Sellinger? Mm, no, it wasn't. That'll be all, Dr. Moore. Uh, here, please. Here's some change. Will you put it in your pocket, please? And I'll just walk past Mrs. Sellinger. Now, think carefully, Mrs. Sellinger. Was that the sound you heard? Uh, well, uh, I'd like to hear it again. Of course. But first, I'd like another person to walk by. Will you please take off your shoes? Yes, Mr. Keg. Before you start, what were you wearing on the night of the murder? I had on this file suit. High heels? I always wear heels. And jewelry? Of course. I don't see what difference my appearance makes. I asked you to wear exactly what you wore that night. I am. Jewelry, too? Well, I didn't think you meant down to the exact jewelry. That night, were you wearing the earrings I saw you take off just now? I believe you put them in your purse. Oh, yes. They were hurting my ears. Will you put them on, please? Now I must ask for a complete silence in the courtroom. All right. You will be first, and you will follow. Uh, uh, that's it. That that last one, I'm sure. The coins. Yes, the coins. That last sound you heard was the jingling of Miss O'Connor's dangling earrings. Oh, no, no. After appearing no. to take the elevator downstairs, you, Liz O'Connor, <laughs> went back into the office, passed Crane and Mrs. Sellinger, filled the hypodermic, took a scalpel, gave Crane an injection, and stabbed him. You then wiped the instruments and put them in a the sterilizer. Hence the metallic click of the lid heard by Mrs. Sellinger. You then left by the back door. Thanks to Mrs. Sellinger's testimony, to her keen perception... We now know it was you who came back to the office that oh, night. No, I knew all along I couldn't get away with it. But I'm not sorry, Mr. K. I'm not sorry. <laughs> Golly, Mr. K, you were wonderful. How'd you get on the track of Liz O'Connor? Jim, if Matthews weren't guilty, then the jingling sound must have come from some wearing apparel. Miss O'Connor's choice of clothing is quite extreme. I imagined her jewelry was just as extreme. The testimony of Mrs. Sellinger, the innocent bystander, again proved that with such cooperation, the truth will out. Yeah, I guess you'll be checking out now, huh? Yeah, I hate to see you go. I guess your vacation was kind of ruined. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. But my stay wasn't ruined. Well, I hope I see you again soon. Goodbye, Jim. Bye, Mr. Keg. And thanks. A Life in Your Hands is created by Earl Stanley Gardner, with script by Marty Everts, directed by John Cowan. Jonathan Keg is played by Carlton Cadell, with musical effects by Adele Scott, conducted by Whitey Burquist. Engineering by Bill Knight. This has been a partially transcribed Bell production. And this is George Stone extending a cordial invitation for each of you to be with us again next week. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Welcome back. You know, I, I, if I were a suspic- uh, superstitious sort, I would probably suggest that Jonathan Keg stop saying that thing about somewhere in, you know, who knows, a crime could just be about to happen. You're jinxing the whole vacation. But I'm not superstitious. I do need to let you know that uh, we are nearing the end of this series. We have only three episodes of A Life in Your Hands left. And so coming in four weeks is The Cases of Mr. Ace, starring Hollywood legend George Raft. We'll have that show for only two weeks. 
And then the Adventures of Frank Race will shift to Tuesday as part of some changes we're making to our schedule to accommodate the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar episodes. All right, well, listener comments and feedback. Uh, this one it actually comes from uh, the uh, Facebook uh, r- reviews for one of the first shows we did from Donald. Uh, Pat Novak is old-time radio at its best. Harder than hard-boiled, the language is quick as a machine gun and just as cold-hearted, yet somehow Pat seems like a good guy, despite the lack of evidence he leaves behind on the lonely and cynical streets of San Francisco. The host, Adam Graham, has a homey, knowledgeable style. His enthusiasm is contagious. He's a fan, not a pro. He's all about inf- uh, informative and interesting. Three cheers for Adam, three cheers for Pat Novak. Well, thanks so much, Donald. I'm glad you enjoyed Pat Novak, and I hope you uh, listen to some of our other shows. Uh, you can uh, check out any of the programs we've done uh, by going to archives.greatdetectives.net, and we have most of them uh, as separate feeds in the iTunes store, because I know we only keep uh, 200 episodes going back. All right, well, join us tomorrow for Let George Do It, and uh, Tuesday it'll be another episode of A Life in Your Hands. In the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and be sure and fill out our listener survey, survey survey.greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.